I had not yet left the police station when, after two days, I was taken to see Mr. Escombe. Two constables were sent to protect me, though no such precaution was then needed. On the day of landing, as soon as the yellow flag was lowered, a representative of the Natal Advertiser had come to interview me. He had asked me a number of questions and in reply I had been able to refute every one of the charges that had been leveled against me. Thanks to Sir Firoz Shah Mehta, I had delivered only written speeches in India and I had copies of them all as well as of my other writings. I had given the interviewer all this literature and showed him that in India I had said nothing which I had not already said in South Africa in stronger language. I had also shown him that I had had no hand in bringing the passengers of the Corland and Naderi to South Africa. Many of them were old residents and most of them far from wanting to stay in Natal meant to go to the Transvaal. In those days, the Transvaal offered better prospects than Natal to those coming in search of wealth and most Indians therefore preferred to go there. This interview and my refusal to prosecute the assailants produced such a profound impression that the Europeans of Durban were ashamed of their conduct. The press declared me to be innocent and condemned the mob. Thus the lynching ultimately proved to be a blessing for me, that is, for the cause. It enhanced the prestige of the Indian community in South Africa and made my work easier. In three or four days I went to my house and it was not long before I settled down again. The incident added also to my professional practice, but if it enhanced the prestige of the community, it also fanned the flame of prejudice against it. As soon as it was proved that the Indian could put up a manly fight, he came to be regarded as a danger. Two bills were introduced in the Natal Legislative Assembly, one of them calculated to affect the Indian trader adversely and the other to impose a stringent restriction on Indian immigration. Fortunately, the fight for the franchise had resulted in a decision to the effect that no enactment might be passed against the Indians as such, that is to say that the law should make no distinctions of color or race. The language of the bills above mentioned made them applicable to all, but their object undoubtedly was to impose further restrictions on the Indian residents of Natal. The bills considerably increased my public work and made the community more alive than ever to their sense of duty. They were translated into Indian languages and fully explained so as to bring home to the community their subtle implications. We appealed to the colonial secretary but he refused to interfere and the bills became law. Public work now began to absorb most of my time. Sergeant Mansuklal Nazar, who as I have said was already in Durban, came to stay with me and as he gave his time to public work, he lightened my burden to some extent. Sheth Adamji Mia Khan had, in my absence, discharged his duty with great credit. He had increased the membership and added about £1,000 to the coffers of the Natal Indian Congress. The awakening caused by the bills and the demonstration against the passengers, I turned to good account by making an appeal for membership and funds, which now amounted to £5,000. My desire was to secure for the Congress a permanent fund so that it might procure property of its own and then carry on its work out of the rent of the property. This was my first experience of managing a public institution. I placed my proposal before my co-workers and they welcomed it. The property that was purchased was leased out and the rent was enough to meet the current expenses of the Congress. The property was vested in a strong body of trustees and is still there today but it has become the source of much internecine quarrelling 
with the result that the rent of the property now accumulates in the court. This sad situation developed after my departure from South Africa, but my idea of having permanent funds for public institutions underwent a change long before this difference arose. And now after considerable experience with the many public institutions which I have managed, it has become my firm conviction that it is not good to run public institutions on permanent funds. A permanent fund carries in itself the seed of the moral fall of the institution. A public institution means an institution conducted with the approval and from the funds of the public. When such an institution ceases to have public support, it forfeits its right to exist. Institutions maintained on permanent funds are often found to ignore public opinion and are frequently responsible for acts contrary to it. In our country, we experience this at every step. Some of the so-called religious trusts have ceased to render any accounts. The trustees have become the owners and are responsible to none. I have no doubt that the ideal is for public institutions to live like nature from day to day. The institution that fails to win public support has no right to exist as such. The subscriptions that an institution annually receives are a test of its popularity and the honesty of its management and I am of opinion that every institution should submit to that test. But let no one misunderstand me. My remarks do not apply to the bodies which cannot by their very nature be conducted without permanent buildings. What I mean to say is that the current expenditure should be found from subscriptions voluntarily received from year to year. These views were confirmed during the days of the Satyagraha in South Africa. That magnificent campaign extending over six years was carried on without permanent funds though lakhs of rupees were necessary for it. I can recollect times when I did not know what would happen the next day if no subscriptions came in. But I shall not anticipate future events. The reader will find the opinion expressed above amply borne out in the coming narrative. When I landed at Durban in January 1897, I had three children with me, my sister's son, ten years old, and my own sons, nine and five years of age. Where was I to educate them? I could have sent them to the schools for European children, but only as a matter of a favor and exception. No other Indian children were allowed to attend them. For these, there were schools established by Christian missions, but I was not prepared to send my children there, as I did not like the education imparted in those schools. For one thing, the medium of instruction would be only English or perhaps incorrect Tamil or Hindi. This too could only have been arranged with difficulty. I could not possibly put up with this and other disadvantages. In the meantime, I was making my own attempt to teach them. But that was at best irregular and I could not get hold of a suitable Gujarati teacher. I was at my wit's end. I advertised for an English teacher who should teach the children under my direction. Some regular instruction was to be given them by this teacher, and for the rest they should be satisfied with what little I could give them irregularly. So I engaged an English governess on seven pounds a month. This went on for some time, but not to my satisfaction. The boys acquired some knowledge of Gujarati through my conversation and intercourse with them, which was strictly in the mother tongue. I was loath to send them back to India, for I believed even then that young children should not be separated from their parents. The education that children naturally imbibe in a well-ordered household is impossible to obtain in hostels. I therefore kept my children with me. I did send my nephew and elder son to be educated at residential schools in India for a few months, but I soon had to recall them. Later, the eldest son, 
long after he had come of age, broke away from me and went to India to join a high school in Ahmedabad. I have an impression that the nephew was satisfied with what I could give him. Unfortunately, he died in the prime of youth after a brief illness. The other three of my sons have never been at public school, though they did get some regular schooling in an improvised school which I started for the children of Satyagrahi parents in South Africa. These experiments were all inadequate. I could not devote to the children all the time I had wanted to give them. My inability to give them enough attention and other unavoidable causes prevented me from providing them with the literary education I had desired and all my sons have had complaints to make against me in this matter. Whenever they come across an MA or a BA or even a matriculate, they seem to feel the handicap of a want of a school education. Nevertheless, I am of opinion that if I had insisted on their being educated somehow at public schools, they would have been deprived of the training that can be had only at the school of experience or from constant contact with the parents. I should never have been free as I am today from anxiety on their score and the artificial education that they could have had in England or South Africa torn from me would never have taught them the simplicity and the spirit of service that they show in their lives today while their artificial ways of living might have been a serious handicap in my public work. Therefore, though I have not been able to give them a literary education either to their or to my satisfaction, I am not quite sure as I look back on my past years that I have not done my duty by them to the best of my capacity. Nor do I regret not having sent them to public schools. I have always felt that the undesirable traits I see today in my eldest son are an echo of my own undisciplined and unformulated early life. I regard that time as a period of half-baked knowledge and indulgence. It coincided with the most impressionable years of my eldest son and naturally he has refused to regard it as my time of indulgence and inexperience. He has on the contrary believed that that was the brightest period of my life and the changes affected later have been due to delusion miscalled enlightenment. And well he might. Why should he not think that my earlier years represented a period of awakening and the latter years of radical change, years of delusion and egotism? Often have I been confronted with various posers from friends. What harm had there been if I had given my boys an academical education? What right had I thus to clip their wings? Why should I have come in the way of their taking degrees and choosing their own careers? I do not think that there is much point in these questions. I have come in contact with numerous students. I have tried myself or through others to impose my educational fads on other children too and have seen the results thereof. There are within my knowledge a number of young men today contemporaneous with my sons. I do not think that man to man they are any better than my sons or that my sons have much to learn from them. But the ultimate result of my experiments is in the womb of the future. My object in discussing this subject here is that a student of the history of a civilization may have some measure of the difference between disciplined home education and school education, and also the effect produced on children through changes introduced by parents in their lives. The purpose of this chapter is also to show the lengths to which a watery of truth is driven by his experiments with truth, as also to show the watery of liberty how many are the sacrifices demanded by that stern goddess. Had I been without a sense of self-respect and satisfied of myself with having for my children the education that other children could not get, I should have deprived them of the object lesson in liberty and self-respect that I gave them at the cost of the literary training. And where a choice has to be made between liberty and learning, who will not say that the former has to be preferred a thousand times 
to the latter. The youths whom I called out in 1920 from those citadels of slavery, their schools and colleges, and whom I advised that it was far better to remain unlettered and break stones for the sake of liberty than to go in for a literary education in the chains of slaves will probably be able now to trace my advice to its source. My profession progressed satisfactorily, but that was far from satisfying me. The question of further simplifying my life and of doing some concrete act of service to my fellow men had been constantly agitating me when a leper came to my door. I had not the heart to dismiss him with a meal, so I offered him shelter, dressed his wounds and began to look after him. But I could not go on like that indefinitely. I could not afford, I lacked the will to keep him always with me. So I sent him to the government hospital for indentured laborers. But I was still ill at ease. I longed for some humanitarian work of a permanent nature. Dr. Booth was the head of the St. Aidan's Mission. He was a kind-hearted man and treated his patients free. Thanks to a Parsi Rustamji's charities, it was possible to open a small charitable hospital under Dr. Booth's charge. I felt strongly inclined to serve as a nurse in this hospital. The work of dispensing medicines took from one to two hours daily and I made up my mind to find time for my office work so as to be able to fill the place of a compounder in the dispensary attached to the hospital. Most of my professional work was a chamber work, conveyancing and arbitration. I of course used to have a few cases in the magistrate's court, but most of them were of a non-controversial character and Mr. Khan, who had followed me to South Africa and was then living with me, undertook to take them if I was absent. So I found time to serve in the small hospital. This work brought me some peace. It consisted in ascertaining the patient's complaints, laying the facts before the doctor and dispensing the prescriptions. It brought me in close touch with the suffering Indians most of them indentured Tamil, Telugu or North Indian men. The experience stood me in good stead when during the Boer War I offered my services for nursing the sick and wounded soldiers. The question of the rearing of children had been ever before me. I had two sons born in South Africa and my service in the hospital was useful in solving the question of their upbringing. My independent spirit was a constant source of a trial. My wife and I had decided to have the best medical aid at the time of her delivery. But if the doctor and the nurse were to leave us in the lurch at the right moment, what was I to do? Then the nurse had to be an Indian. And the difficulty of getting a trained Indian nurse in South Africa can be easily imagined from the similar difficulty in India. So I studied the things necessary for safe labor. I read Dr. Tribhuvan Das book, Advice to a Mother, and I nursed both my children according to the instructions given in the book, tempered here and there by experience as I had gained elsewhere. The services of a nurse were utilized not for more than two months each time chiefly for helping my wife and not for taking care of the babies which I did myself. The birth of the last child put me to the severest test. The travel came on suddenly. The doctor was not immediately available and some time was lost in fetching the midwife. Even if she had been on the spot, she could not have helped delivery. I had to see through the safe delivery of the baby. My careful study of the subject in Dr. Tribhuvanda's work was of inestimable help. I was not nervous. I am convinced that for the proper upbringing of children, the parents ought to have a general knowledge of the care and nursing of babies. At every step, I have seen the advantages of my careful study of the subject. My children would not have enjoyed the general health that they do today 
had I not studied the subject and turned my knowledge to account. We labor under a sort of superstition that a child has nothing to learn during the first five years of its life. On the contrary, the fact is that the child never learns in afterlife what it does in its first five years. The education of the child begins with conception. The physical and mental states of the parents at the moment of conception are reproduced in the baby. Then, during the period of pregnancy, it continues to be affected by the mother's moods, desires and temperament and also by her ways of life. After birth, the child imitates the parents and for a considerable number of years entirely depends on them for its growth. The couple who realize these things will never have sexual union for the fulfillment of their lust, but only when they desire issue. I think it is the height of ignorance to believe that the sexual act is an independent function necessary like sleeping or eating. The world depends for its existence on the act of generation, and as the world is the playground of God and a reflection of His glory, the act of generation should be controlled for the ordered growth of the world. He who realizes this will control his lust at any cost, equip himself with the knowledge necessary for the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of his progeny and give the benefit of that knowledge to posterity. We now reach the stage in this story when I began seriously to think of taking the Brahmacharya vow. I had been wedded to a monogamous ideal ever since my marriage, faithfulness to my wife being part of the love of truth. But it was in South Africa that I came to realize the importance of observing Brahmacharya even with respect to my wife. I cannot definitely say what circumstance or what book it was that set my thoughts in that direction, but I have a recollection that the predominant factor was the influence of Rechand Bhai, of whom I have already written, I can still recall a conversation that I had with him. On one occasion I spoke to him in high praise of Mrs. Gladstone's devotion to her husband. I had read somewhere that Mrs. Gladstone insisted on preparing tea for Mr. Gladstone even in the House of Commons, and that this had become a rule in the life of this illustrious couple whose actions were governed by regularity. I spoke of this to the poet and incidentally eulogized conjugal love. Which of the two do you prize more? asked Rachel Bhai. The love of Mrs. Gladstone for her husband as his wife or her devoted service irrespective of her relation to Mr. Gladstone. Supposing she had been his sister, or his devoted servant, and ministered to him with the same attention, what would you have said? Do we not have instances of such devoted sisters or servants? Supposing you had found the same loving devotion in a male servant, would you have been pleased in the same way as in Mrs. Gladstone's case? Just examine the viewpoint suggested by me. Rachel Bhai was himself married. I have an impression that at the moment his words sounded harsh, but they gripped me irresistibly. The devotion of a servant was, I felt, a thousand times more praiseworthy than that of a wife to her husband. There was nothing surprising in the wife's devotion to her husband, as there was an indissoluble bond between them. The devotion was perfectly natural but it required a special effort to cultivate equal devotion between master and servant. The poet's point of view began gradually to grow upon me. What then, I asked myself, should be my relation with my wife? Did my faithfulness consist in making my wife the instrument of my lust? So long as I was the slave of lust, my faithfulness was worth nothing. To be fair to my wife, I must say that she was never the temptress. It was therefore the easiest thing for me to take the vow of Brahmacharya, if only I willed it. It was my weak will or lustful attachment that was the obstacle. Even after my conscience had been roused in the matter, I failed twice, 
I failed because the motive that actuated the effort was none the highest. My main object was to escape having more children. Whilst in England, I had read something about contraceptives. I have already referred to Dr. Ellinson's birth control propaganda in the chapter on vegetarianism. If it had some temporary effect on me, Mr. Hill's opposition to those methods and his advocacy of internal efforts as opposed to outward means, in a word of self-control, had a far greater effect, which in due time came to be abiding. Seeing therefore that I did not desire more children, I began to strive after self-control. There was endless difficulty in the task. We began to sleep in separate beds. I decided to retire to bed only after the day's work had left me completely exhausted. All these efforts did not seem to bear much fruit, but when I look back upon the past, I feel that the final resolution was the cumulative effect of those unsuccessful strivings. The final resolution could only be made as late as 1906. Satyagraha had not then been started. I had not the least notion of its coming. I was practicing in Johannesburg at the time of the Zulu rebellion in Natal, which came soon after the Boer War. I felt that I must offer my services to the Natal government on that occasion. The offer was accepted as we shall see in another chapter. But the work set me furiously thinking in the direction of self-control, and according to my wont, I discussed my thoughts with my co-workers. It became my conviction that procreation and the consequent care of children were inconsistent with public service. I had to break up my household at Johannesburg to be able to serve during the rebellion. Within one month of offering my services, I had to give up the house I had so carefully furnished. I took my wife and children to Phoenix and let the Indian Ambulance Corps attached to the Natal forces. During the difficult marches that had then to be performed, the idea flashed upon me that if I wanted to devote myself to the service of the community in this manner, I must relinquish the desire for children and wealth and live the life of a vana prastha, of one retired from household cares. The rebellion did not occupy me for more than six weeks, but this brief period proved to be a very important epoch in my life. The importance of vows grew upon me more clearly than ever before. I realized that a vow far from closing the door to real freedom opened it. Up to this time I had not met with success because that will had been lacking. Because I had had no faith in myself, no faith in the grace of God and therefore my mind had been tossed on the boisterous sea of doubt. I realized that in refusing to take a vow, man was drawn into temptation, and that to be bound by a vow was like a passage from libertinism to a real monogamous marriage. I believe in effort, I do not want to bind myself with vows, is the mentality of weakness and betrays a subtle desire for the thing to be avoided. Or where can be the difficulty in making a final decision? I vow to flee from the serpent which I know will bite me, I do not simply make an effort to flee from him. I know that mere effort may mean certain death. Mere effort means ignorance of the certain fact that the serpent is bound to kill me. The fact therefore that I could rest content with an effort only means that I have not yet clearly realized the necessity of a definite action. But supposing my views are changed in future, how can I bind myself by a vow? Such a doubt often deters us. But the doubt also betrays a lack of a clear perception that a particular thing must be renounced. That is why Nishkulanand has sung. Renunciation without aversion is not lasting. Where therefore the desire is gone, a vow of renunciation is the natural and inevitable fruit. After full discussion and mature deliberation, I took the vow in 1906. I had not shared my thoughts with my wife until then, 
but only consulted her at the time of taking the vow. She had no objection. But I had great difficulty in making the final resolve. I had not the necessary strength. How was I to control my passions? The elimination of a carnal relationship with one's wife seemed then a strange thing. But I launched forth with faith in the sustaining power of God. As I look back upon the twenty years of the vow, I am filled with pleasure and wonderment. The more or less successful practice of self-control had been going on since 1901. But the freedom and joy that came to me after taking the vow had never been experienced before 1906. Before the vow, I had been open to being overcome by temptation at any moment. Now the vow was a sure shield against temptation. The great potentiality of Brahmacharya daily became more an open patent to me. The vow was taken when I was in Phoenix. As soon as I was free from ambulance work, I went to Phoenix, whence I had to return to Johannesburg. In about a month of my returning there, the foundation of Satyagraha was laid. As though unknown to me, the Brahmacharya vow had been preparing me for it. Satyagraha had not been a preconceived plan. It came on spontaneously without my having willed it. But I could see that all my previous steps had led up to that goal. I had cut down my heavy household expenses at Johannesburg and gone to Phoenix to take, as it were, the Brahmacharya vow. The knowledge that a perfect observance of Brahmacharya means realization of Brahman I did not owe to a study of the Shastras. It slowly grew upon me with experience. The Shastric texts on the subject I read only later in life. Every day of the vow has taken me nearer the knowledge that in Brahmacharya lies the protection of the body, the mind and the soul. For Brahmacharya was now no process of hard penance, it was a matter of consolation and joy. Every day revealed a fresh beauty in it. But if it was a matter of ever-increasing joy, let no one believe that it was an easy thing for me. Even when I am past fifty-six years, I realize how hard a thing it is. Every day I realize more and more that it is like walking on the sword's edge, and I see every moment the necessity for eternal vigilance. Control of the palate is the first essential in the observance of the vow. I found that complete control of the palate made the observance very easy and so I now pursued my dietetic experiments not merely from the vegetarians but also from the brahmacharis point of view. As the result of these experiments, I saw that the brahmacharis food should be limited, simple, spiceless and if possible uncooked. Six years of experiments have showed me that the brahmacharis ideal food is fresh fruit and nuts. The immunity from passion that I enjoyed when I lived on this food was unknown to me after I changed that diet. Brahmacharya needed no effort on my part in South Africa when I lived on fruits and nuts alone. It has been a matter of a very great effort ever since I began to take milk. How I had to go back to milk from a fruit diet will be considered in its proper place. It is enough to observe here that I have not the least doubt that milk diet makes the brahmacharya vow difficult to observe. Let no one deduce from this that all brahmacharis must give up milk. The effect on brahmacharya of different kinds of food can be determined only after numerous experiments. I have yet to find a fruit substitute for milk, which is an equally good muscle builder and easily digestible. The doctors, Vaidyas and Hakims have alike failed to enlighten me. Therefore, though I know milk to be partly a stimulant, I cannot for the time being advise anyone to give it up. As an external aid to Brahmacharya, Fasting is as necessary as a selection and restriction in diet. 
so overpowering are the senses that they can be kept under control only when they are completely hedged in on all sides from above and from beneath. It is common knowledge that they are powerless without food, and so fasting undertaken with a view to control of the senses is, I have no doubt, very helpful. With some, fasting is of no avail, because, assuming that mechanical fasting alone will make them immune, they keep their bodies without food, but feast their minds upon all sorts of delicacies, thinking all the while what they will eat and what they will drink, after the fast terminates. Such fasting helps them in controlling neither palate nor lust. Fasting is useful when mind cooperates with the starving body, that is to say, when it cultivates a distaste for the objects that are denied to the body. Mind is at the root of all sensuality. Fasting therefore has a limited use, for a fasting man may continue to be swayed by passion. But it may be said that extinction of the sexual passion is, as a rule, impossible without fasting, which may be said to be indispensable for the observance of Brahmacharya. Many aspirants of to Brahmacharya fail because, in the use of their other senses, they want to carry on like those who are not Brahmacharis. Their effort is therefore identical with the effort to experience the bracing cold of winter in the scorching summer months. There should be a clear line between the life of a brahmachari and of one who is not. The resemblance that there is between the two is only apparent. The distinction ought to be clear as daylight. Both use their eyesight, but whereas the brahmachari uses it to see the glories of God, the other uses it to see the frivolity around him. Both use their ears, but whereas the one hears nothing but praises of God, the other feasts his ears upon ribaldry. Both often keep late hours, but whereas the one devotes them to prayer, the other fritters them away in wild and wasteful mirth. Both feed the inner man, but the one only to keep the temple of God in good repair, while the other gorges himself and makes the sacred vessel a stinking gutter. Thus both live as the poles apart, and the distance between them will grow and not diminish with the passage of time. Brahmacharya means control of the senses in thought, word and deed. Every day I have been realizing more and more the necessity for restraints of the kind I have detailed above. There is no limit to the possibilities of renunciation even as there is none to those of Brahmacharya. Such Brahmacharya is impossible of attainment by limited effort. For many it must remain only as an ideal. An aspirant of Brahmacharya will always be conscious of his shortcomings, will seek out the passions lingering in the innermost recesses of his heart and will incessantly strive to get rid of them. So long as thought is not under complete control of the will, Brahmacharya in its fullness is absent. Involuntary thought is an affection of the mind, and curbing of thought therefore means curbing of the mind, which is even more difficult to curb than the wind. Nevertheless, the existence of God within makes even control of the mind possible. Let no one think that it is impossible because it is difficult. It is the highest goal, and it is no wonder that the highest effort should be necessary to attain it. But it was after coming to India that I realized that such Brahmacharya was impossible to attain by mere human effort. Until then, I had been laboring under the delusion that fruit diet alone would enable me to eradicate all passions, and I had flattered myself with the belief that I had nothing more to do. But I must not anticipate the chapter of my struggle. Meanwhile, let me make it clear that those who desire to observe Brahmacharya with a view to realizing God need not despair, provided their faith in God is equal to their confidence in their own effort. Vishaya vinivartante nirahara dehinaha rasavarjam rasopyasya param drishtva nivartate 
The sense objects turn away from an abstemious soul, leaving the relish behind. The relish also disappears with the realization of the highest. Therefore, His name and His grace are the last resources of the aspirant after moksha. This truth came to me only after my return to India. I had started on a life of ease and comfort, but the experiment was short-lived. Although I had furnished the house with care, yet it failed to have any hold on me. So, no sooner had I launched forth on that life than I began to cut down expenses. The washerman's bill was heavy, and as he was besides by no means noted for his punctuality, even two or three dozen shirts and collars proved insufficient for me. Collars had to be changed daily and shirts, if not daily, at least every alternate day. This meant a double expense, which appeared to me unnecessary. So I equipped myself with a washing outfit to save it. I bought a book on washing, studied the art and taught it also to my wife. This no doubt added to my work, but its novelty made it a pleasure. I shall never forget the first collar that I washed myself. I had used more starch than necessary, the iron had not been made hot enough, and for fear of burning the collar, I had not pressed it sufficiently. The result was that, though the collar was fairly stiff, the superfluous starch continually dropped off it. I went to court with the collar on, thus inviting the ridicule of a brother barristers, but even in those days I could be impervious to ridicule. Well, said I, this is my first experiment at washing my own collars and hence the loose starch. But it does not trouble me and then there is the advantage of providing you with so much fun. But surely there is no lack of laundries here, asked a friend. The laundry bill is very heavy, said I. The charge for washing a collar is almost as much as its price and even then there is eternal dependence on the washerman. I prefer by far to wash my things myself. But I could not make my friends appreciate the beauty of self-help. In course of time, I became an expert washerman so far as my own work went and my washing was by no means inferior to laundry washing. My collars were no less stiff or shiny than others. When Gokhale came to South Africa, he had with him a scarf which was a gift from Mahadev Govind Ranade. He treasured the memento with the utmost care and used it only on special occasions. One such occasion was the banquet given in his honor by the Johannesburg Indians. The scarf was creased and needed ironing. It was not possible to send it to the laundry and get it back in time. I offered to try my art. I can trust to your capacity as a lawyer, but not as a washerman, said Gokhale. What if you should soil it? Do you know what it means to me? With this he narrated, with much joy, the story of the gift. I still insisted, guaranteed good work, got his permission to iron it, and won his certificate. After that, I did not mind if the rest of the world refused me its certificate. In the same way, as I freed myself from slavery to the washerman, I threw off dependence on the barber. All people who go to England learn there at least the art of shaving, but none, to my knowledge, learn to cut their own hair. I had to learn that too. I once went to an English hair cutter in Pretoria. He contemptuously refused to cut my hair. I certainly felt hurt, but immediately purchased a pair of clippers and cut my hair before the mirror. I succeeded more or less in cutting the front hair, but I spoiled the back. The friends in the court shook with laughter. What is wrong with your hair, Gandhi? Rats have been at it? No, the white barber would not condescend to touch my black hair, said I, so I preferred to cut it myself, no matter how badly. The reply did not surprise the friends. The barber was not at fault in having refused to cut my hair. There was every chance of his losing his custom 
if he should serve black men. We do not allow our barbers to serve our untouchable brethren. I got the reward of this in South Africa not once but many times, and the conviction that it was the punishment for our own sins saved me from becoming angry. The extreme forms in which my passion for self-help and simplicity ultimately expressed itself will be described in their proper place. The seed had been long sown. It only needed watering to take root, to flower and to fructify, and the watering came in due course. I must skip many other experiences of the period between 1897 and 1899 and come straight to the Boer War. When the war was declared, my personal sympathies were all with the Boers, but I believed then that I had yet no right in such cases to enforce my individual convictions. I have minutely dealt with the inner struggle regarding this in my history of the Satyagraha in South Africa and I must not repeat the argument here. I invite the curious to turn to those pages. Suffice it to say that my loyalty to the British rule drove me to participation with the British in that war. I felt that if I demanded rights as a British citizen, it was also my duty as such to participate in the defense of the British Empire. I held then that India could achieve her complete emancipation only within and through the British Empire. So I collected together as many comrades as possible and with every great difficulty got their services accepted as an ambulance corps. The average Englishman believed that the Indian was a coward, incapable of taking risks or looking beyond his immediate self-interest. Many English friends, therefore, threw cold water on my plan. But Dr. Booth supported it wholeheartedly. He trained us in ambulance work. We secured medical certificates of fitness for service. Mr. Lofton and the late Mr. Ascombe enthusiastically supported the plan and we applied at last for service at the front. The government thankfully acknowledged our application but said that our services were not then needed. I would not rest satisfied, however, with this refusal. Through the introduction of Dr. Booth, I called on the Bishop of Natal. There were many Christian Indians in our corps. The bishop was delighted with my proposal and promised to help us in getting our services accepted. Time too was working with us. The boyer had shown more pluck, determination and bravery than had been expected. And our services were ultimately needed. Our corps was 1,100 strong with nearly 40 leaders, about 300 were free Indians and the rest indentured. Dr. Booth was also with us. The corps acquitted itself well. Though our work was to be outside the firing line and though we had the protection of the Red Cross, we were asked at a critical moment to serve within the firing line. The reservation had not been of our seeking. The authorities did not want us to be within the range of fire. The situation, however, was changed after the repulse at Spion Corp and General Buller sent the message that, though we were not bound to take the risk, government would be thankful if we would do so and fetch the wounded from the field. We had no hesitation and so the action at Spion Corp found us working within the firing line. During these days we had to march from 20 to 25 miles a day bearing the wounded on stretchers. Amongst the wounded, we had the honor of carrying soldiers like General Woodgate. The Corps was disbanded after six weeks' service. After the reserves at Spion Corp and Walkrans, the British Commander-in-Chief abandoned the attempt to relieve Ladysmith and other places by summary procedure and decided to proceed slowly, awaiting reinforcements from England and India. Our humble work was at the moment much applauded and the Indians' prestige was enhanced. The newspapers published laudatory rhymes with the refrain, 
We are sons of empire after all. General Buller mentioned with appreciation the work of the Corps in his dispatch and the Laidots were awarded the war medal. The Indian community became better organized. I got into closer touch with the indentured Indians. There came a greater awakening amongst them and the feeling that Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Tamilians, Gujaratis and Sindhis were all Indians and children of the same motherland took deep root amongst them. Everyone believed that the Indians' grievances were now sure to be redressed. At the moment, the white man's attitude seemed to be distinctly changed. The relations formed with the whites during the war were of the sweetest. We had come in contact with thousands of Tommies. They were friendly with us and thankful for being there to serve them. I cannot forbear from recording a sweet reminiscence of how human nature shows itself at its best in moments of trial. We were marching towards Shivali camp where Lieutenant Roberts, the son of Lord Roberts, had received a mortal wound. Our corps had the honor of carrying the body from the field. It was a sultry day, the day of our march. Everyone was thirsting for water. There was a tiny brook on the way where we could slake our thirst. But who was to drink first? We had proposed to come in after the Tommies had finished. But they would not begin first and urged us to do so. And for a while a pleasant competition went on for giving precedence to one another. It has always been impossible for me to reconcile myself to any one member of the body politic remaining out of use. I have always been loath to hide or connive at the weak points of the community or to press for its rights without having purged it of its blemishes. Therefore, ever since my settlement in Natal, I had been endeavoring to clear the community of a charge that had been leveled against it, not without a certain amount of truth. The charge had often been made that the Indian was slovenly in his habits and did not keep his house and surroundings clean. The principal men of the community had, therefore, already begun to put their houses in order. But house-to-house -house inspection was undertaken only when plague was reported to be imminent in Durban. This was done after consulting and gaining the approval of the city fathers who had desired our cooperation. Our cooperation made work easier for them and at the same time lessened our hardships. For whenever there is an outbreak of epidemics, the executive, as the general rule, get impatient, take excessive measures and behave to such as may have incurred their displeasure with a heavy hand. The community saved itself from this oppression by voluntarily taking sanitary measures. But I had some bitter experiences. I saw that I could not so easily count on the help of the community in getting it to do its own duty as I could in claiming for its rights. At some places I met with insults, at others with polite indifference. It was too much for people to be still themselves to keep their surroundings clean. To expect them to find money for the work was out of the question. These experiences taught me better than ever before that without infinite patience it was impossible to get the people to do any work. It is the reformer who is anxious for the reform and not society from which he should expect nothing better than opposition, abhorrence and even mortal persecution. Why may not society regard as a retrogression what the reformer holds dear as life itself? Nevertheless, the result of this agitation was that the Indian community learned to recognize more or less the necessity for keeping their houses and environments clean. I gained the esteem of the authorities. They saw that, though I had made it my business to ventilate grievances and press for rights, I was no less keen and insistent upon self-purification. There was one thing, however, which still remained to be done, namely, 
the awakening in the Indian settler of a sense of duty to the motherland. India was poor. The Indian settler went to South Africa in search of wealth and he was bound to contribute part of his earnings for the benefit of his countrymen in the hovel of their adversity. This the settler did during the terrible famines of 1897 and 1899. They contributed handsomely for famine relief and more so in 1899 than in 1897. We had appealed to Englishmen also for funds and they had responded well. Even the indentured Indians gave their share to the contribution and the system inaugurated at the time of these famines has been continued ever since and we know that Indians in South Africa never failed to send handsome contributions to India in times of national calamity. Does service of the Indians in South Africa ever revealed to me new implications of truth at every stage. Truth is like a vast tree, which yields more and more fruit, the more you nurture it. The deeper the search in the mine of truth, the richer the discovery of the gems buried there, in the shape of openings for an ever greater variety of service.